Okay, it says recording started, so right. we are good to go. Okay. Good. Hello, everyone. I'm Gordon Mooneyhan, W4EGM, and I'm here with Bill Maureen, N2COP. Bill is the Vice Director of the Roanoke Division. I'm Public Information Coordinator for the South Carolina Section. And we're going to talk about the Phil McGann Award. Bill, who was Phil McGann? Hi, Gordon, and good afternoon to you and all those who are watching this video. Phil McGann um, was a ham uh, who was the first to recognize in the post-World War II era that was incumbent upon amateur radio to ensure that what amateur radio does is told to the general public and to elected officials. And he formed in the, uh, uh, or he was the person who created really the first uh, public relations position inside ARL. Uh, he was a uh, newspaper reporter himself and uh, saw the need to really expand upon this. And uh, through his efforts and in his memory, ARL created a permanent public relations committee, which has been in existence since 1992, with the goal that um, that committee helps set policy for field public information coordinators and public information officers. Okay, and both of us have won the award. You won it well, in... Well, yes. It, 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 this can sound to some as self-serving, but I think because we're winners of the award, I think you and I really recognize what the importance is of uh, telling the story about amateur radio to the general public. Exactly. You know, uh, we're, we're not bragging about having won the award, but I don't know how you feel about it, but to me it means... Yes, we, we need to tell about amateur radio. We have the desire to tell. You it's, know, there's, it's a, there's times when I want to go out and shout, hey, this is what we do. But, you know, well, I try to and there's a need. One of the, And I'm glad you invited me today because more than ever, there's a need to tell our story um, to the general public and to... Uh, government officials, and, and here's why. Um, back before the advent of direct dial capability, which really came about in the late 50s and early 60s, um, amateur radio was understood very well by the general public because it was a means of long distance communications, not only without a cost to it, but also in terms of uh, reliability. Then with the advent of direct dial, the public found that uh, even though it was expensive, they could dial somebody else quickly uh, and reliably. And then uh, later came, of course, uh, cell service. And uh, with each generation of commercial availability for long distance voice, uh, the understanding of what amateur radio about has uh, regrettably diminished among the general public. And Gordon, it is really key that if we as amateur radio operators wish to see uh, our availability to our craft continue, it's important that we engage these people and educate them as to what it is we do. Um, let me just toss an interesting analogy out at you, if I may. Amateur radio operators have access to the second largest swath of spectrum in the United States after the federal government. In other words, um, think of it this way. If you think of a map of the United States, I tell people that amateur radio is like the state of Alaska. Um, it is a huge territory, but without many people in it. Right now, as we speak, there's 780,000 federally licensed amateur radio operators. That uh, equates to a roughly uh, two and a half percent of the American population. So two and a half percent of the American population has access to the second largest amount of frequency and spectrum. 
And you can imagine as more and more commercial entities do the math, they would say, why is only three quarters of a million people getting access to this when we can find commercial purposes for it? And we are in continual danger of losing spectrum. So education of the public through what we do is really vital. You're right, it is. Um, last weekend, two weekends ago, I was a volunteer at Sandblast Rally, an off-road car race over in Shiraw, South Carolina. Amateur operators operated for 12 hours. 55 of us came together to make the communications for that event possible. There was a fire in one of the cars. Cell service was sporadic at best. You could move five feet and not have a signal. And it was thanks to ham operators that emergency service was able to get there, put the fire out, and prevent it from becoming a major catastrophe. As it was just the driver's ego got, got damaged. Uh, you know, we saved, saved a woods fire. And, uh, you know, what we do, we're, we're in the background, so no one knows. And that's what public relations is about. You know, when back in, 19, back in 2018, when you presented the award to me, it was almost a sense of vindication. And vindication may be too strong a word, but I can remember being at club meetings, talking about what I was doing, and in the back of the room, eyes were rolling. Like, you know, whoopee. You know, what's this guy do with ham radio? And, you know, receiving the award was kind of a vindication to me. It, it made me realize, and I think made a lot of club members realize that, yes, public relations is important. Well, it, it is, and uh, in this day and age, uh, you and I can cite uh, stories that have not necessarily been told to the public. Uh, and, I, and let's talk about another public safety uh, event, and this took place in 2021 at a uh, race in Texas where amateur radio was supplying communications. Um, apparently, a truck uh, was caught on a set of railroad tracks uh, with a train approaching with no cell signal and amateur radio operators alerted the railroad, which in turn was able to stop the train in time to prevent an accident. Um, and then we hear the stories occasionally about hikers who get lost in, and uh, uh, where there's no cell service in, in uh, the countryside and amateur radio is available to do it. So. We, in the realm of public safety, there's no question uh, as to the value added we bring, uh, not to mention large, wide-scale disasters such as uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, and, and wildfires. Um, but the other aspect too, Gordon, is that while a lot of people's older memory may look at amateur radio at, for its uh, long-distance capabilities, as, as I mentioned uh, several decades ago, today, uh, with the commercial network giving that options uh, there. Really, uh, our calling is, and where we really need to educate the public, is in the area of public safety and also uh, in the area of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, with a license, so many people can experiment, and that's something that we don't showcase enough. Um, and. The future wireless engineers that uh, this nation depends on, a lot of that education can be cultivated uh, through amateur radio. So there, the educational and public safety benefits are two aspects that really need to be uh, told to the public and again to, to the lawmakers and, and regulators. You're right. Um, you know, if it wasn't for amateur radio, we wouldn't have these cell phones now because the amateur radio engineers 
developed the original technology to put a computer in the palm of your hand. And, you're absolutely, you're absolutely yeah. right. I, t I tell people all the time that uh, if I'm at a, speaking in the general public, I'll say, does anybody own a two-way radio? Nobody puts their hand up. I go, anybody have a cell phone? And of course, people immediately put their hands up. I said, well, your cell phone is a two-way radio. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, if I recall correctly, amateur radio operators pioneered the technology that eventually made cell phones possible. Well, it's been it, it's so much of the, uh, when you think about it, uh, repeater technology, uh, which has been around since the late 50s and 60s, is a really a, a more primitive version of today's cell network. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I was alluding to, but... I wasn't quite sure, so I didn't want to say, but I knew that you would know. Well, I, I, I never want to say that all communications technologies are invented by hands. Some of them are, but I think we can all safely say that a lot of the um, perfect perfection of commercial communications technologies have gone through some kind of aspect of testing through amateur radio before being introduced into the commercial sphere yes that that is true um, you know it's it's just so amazing before before I became a ham yeah I kind of knew but once I got the license then I really began to understand how this hobby has affected the technology of our country. Uh, the first, the first transatlantic wireless television broadcast. If I and I'm going by memory on this, correct me if I'm wrong. 1928, and it was between two amateur radio operators. How did well, I do? It, 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 well, I. That one, I, uh, it, 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 I'm not quite as up on that one, but there's been roughly, if you look at the last 100 plus years of uh, wireless communications, there seems to be anywhere from a 10 to 20 year advanced use of technologies by amateur radio before there is widespread commercial introduction of those same technologies. Um, and that there's just a pattern there. I mean, for example, you can look at uh, Reginald Fessenden with his first use of AM in 1903, and then the first uh, 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 commercial AM radio applications in 1920, 17 years later. Um, same with FM with uh, Major Armstrong. He uh, 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 he started to uh, I think it finally came into the mode we know today, somewhere in the, the mid-1930s, and the major rollout uh, of FM broadcasting came after World War II. So technologies that we're playing with today, on the state of the art technologies in amateur radio, the public will be enjoying 10 to 20 years from now. And we are a laboratory, um, and an important laboratory to both uh, the United States and to the world. And uh, there's always the danger that if you take away spectrum, you can inadvertently cut off a source of uh, uh, opportunity for, for looking. Let, let me share an example with you. I had a very delightful uh, meeting uh, a couple of years ago with the students who make up the Amateur Radio Club at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia. I was talking with the president of the club, and he said, we have seven, uh, excuse me, 27 members. I go, that's fantastic. Are you guys active in contesting? No. Um, are you active on um, like two meter FM? Well, we have a repeater at the school, but not many people talk on it. I go, well, if you're an active club and you're not active in contesting or DXing or FM, what is it that you people are doing? And he said, most of us are using amateur radio for experimentation for control of drones, uh, especially said in 
West Virginia, they are experimenting with the use of drones for agricultural, future agricultural applications and in mining. He said it's easier to send a drone down into mines than it is necessarily to send a human. And when you think about that, that's a very novel approach. Now there are electrical engineers that are working on technologies that are going to benefit uh, mankind down the road. And unless I had spoken to them, there's nobody I know who is, is sharing that story at the moment. And there are dozens and dozens of stories like this that are not being told to the public. Yeah. Uh, oh, great. I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, when you presented the award to me, you, you told that story, and there was another one that you told. Uh, great, it's, it's uh, killing uh, me. It, what? Well, uh, usually, usually it has to do with most PIOs are extraordinarily handsome. <laughs> well, I have a face for newspapers, so yeah. that doesn't count me. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know it's important I feel that we recognize the contribution that PIOs make MPICs and I, th I think that it's important that word get out about the award you know I'm on the public relations committee for the AWRL and I'd like to see more than just one or two entries come in for the McCann Award. And you know, just because someone doesn't get it one year doesn't mean don't try the next year. You know, it's because it's, it's not based on just one year's work, it's your body of work. Right, and consistency. And it, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, last I saw, there are somewhere, I believe, in the vicinity of 350 people in the United States, ARL members, who hold the appointment of Public Information Officer, PIO. And I think you and I know, unfortunately, that uh, only a subset of those are truly active in trying to ensure that, that the word gets out. Um, and amateur radio operators just tend to be, and I mean this in the nicest way, um, introverts. And by that, what I mean is we get excited talking between and among ourselves as to what we're achieving, but we don't necessarily package that and tell the general public um, what it is that we're doing. And one of the greatest uh, descriptions of amateur radio I ever heard, came, and I don't even remember the source. It was a, it was a ham in California. I would never be able to find this, but he referred to amateur, amateur radio as a hobby with purpose. I've always liked that because I think that truly describes what it is that we do. I like that. Yeah, we're a hobby with purpose. And going back to talking about we're introverts we love talking to each other but to the public oh my uh i remember one time having one tv stations in come over to the house five o'clock in the morning and it was hey can someone come over and help me so i'm not the only one talking and finally one fell in the club, Jim Grant came over, said, yeah, I'll come. And uh, we had a blast with the two hour, uh, we were on two or three minute segments each half hour. And I remember one time, one of the segments, I got on the Wilmington or North Carolina repeater and uh, let the reporter drag you with one of the fellows up in Wilmington and uh, you know she had a blast doing it well wow, that was fun another time at field day when we had to get on the air station had a young girl I don't know 13 14 years old 
and I was running to go to station and she was spent probably 25-30 minutes talking with him in Argentina and you know the look in her eyes that well I can do this without a phone it was I had a sim- it was amazing it was I I had uh, several similar experiences because for many years I've been helping out with uh, the scout uh, event known as Jota J O T A Jamboree on the Air, which is always the third weekend of October. And uh, one time when the bands were in quite good shape, um, we had several uh, Boy Scouts talking on 12 meters with a group of scouts in one of the Caribbean islands, and. Uh, those scouts were talking about the game of cricket and why it was important to them. Uh, And we also spoke to a a group of uh, scouts who were uh, camping. It was a joint effort between Canadian and American scouts uh, camping on the border between Canada and the U.S. The Canadian scouts were camping on the American side and the American scouts were, were camping on the Canadian side and they were moving the station back and forth switching call signs over the the two jurisdictions <laughs> and but but it, it was a great conversation because it really educated um scouts as to what does it mean to cross a border from one nation to another um and so there were lots of educational purposes behind that too yes uh you know going back to stem yeah, we, we can meld so nicely with STEM, uh, and yet people don't want to take advantage of it. And, well, and, and you know, they, uh, there's lots of reasons. Uh, I, I feel badly for educators today because many of them are under the gun to, uh, particularly in the post current and post-pandemic era, uh, of trying to reach curriculum goals and not really having a lot of latitude for the flexibility of introducing something outside the lesson plan, including something like amateur radio. Uh, We're not the only ones who have seen the the fallback in what used to be called after-school clubs. Uh, There are a lot of uh, entities, if it isn't sports, there's not a lot going on afterwards. And that's that's hard to find youth engagement in that realm. Um, But I hope that in the years ahead, Uh, and ARL is working on this now, is looking at a way to inject amateur radio applications into science curriculum, uh, not only in public schools, but also for those who are homeschooled, which is a, uh, actually a very large market segment. Yeah, uh, you know, you talk about schooling. I was terrible at math. Algebra drove me absolutely crazy because I could see no practical use for it. If there had been an amateur radio club, then hey, yeah, it makes sense. It comes together. But absolutely, you know, anybody it, anybody who's ever calculated how to build a simple di- dipole antenna has been using algebra. Yeah, you know, and. Uh, you know, but, you know, a lot of problems with schooling is you don't realize the practical aspects of it. And that that needs to change, but that's a whole other subject. That, that is. And it, it gets back to you, youth is wasted on the young. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the other thing I really want to bring up, Gordon, if I may, is there's a trend underway, which I don't think is healthy in terms of public relations and amateur radio. And it is social media. And what I mean by that is social media has the potential to be an absolutely uh, game-changing technology in public relations for amateur radio. But I'm afraid so many of our amateur radio brethren are limiting themselves. And what I mean by that is it's very easy to do a amateur radio post but have that post really be confined among ourselves with no real invitation or stimulus to have people outside of amateur radio learn what we're doing. 
So I am uh, constantly running into amateur radio operators who take great pride in things that they've posted, and they are meritorious things that they've posted. But the only people who are engaging them are fellow amateur radio operators, and with no side benefit going to those. Um, and so I'm on a personal campaign now that our public information offers, uh, officers should really have a, uh, a two-pronged approach to amateur radio. Um, social media, but expand your sphere of social media to local newspapers, particularly Twitter is excellent for that, uh, and to government officials, uh, particularly elected government officials, so they know what you're doing. And the second is so many people unfortunately have given up on traditional media, meaning newspapers, broadcast television news, and broadcast radio. And you know, and I know, Gordon, that when it comes time for public officials, be they local public officials, state public officials, or federal public officials, when they are looking for a media citation to bolster something that they want to uh, support, they don't look at the number of hits on social media. They will show or display an article in a newspaper or a video clip from a recognized uh, television news source. And I am constantly reminding public information officers that um, it's important that traditional media be included uh, in the influence that you're trying to, to cater. Um, you, so many times, uh, Gordon, I hear about uh, amateur radio operators who go to their local uh, zoning or planning department to get an antenna permit, and these are permits that would normally be permitted, and the people to whom they're applying have no idea what is amateur radio, and sometimes are inclined to deny a building permit because they have no knowledge of what that is. And when asked, can you give me an example of, of what it is that you do? There are no citations uh, to which the uh, applicant can point and say, "You, uh, this is what we do. This is, this is why we are a core of citizens that can help. Um, and it, it's, it's, that's why it's important to remain vigilant in the area of uh, public relations. Yeah, uh, you know, during hurricanes, living along the coast. I'm at Channel 13 here in Myrtle Beach. You know, uh, I, I earn my keep there, monitor what's going on, and, uh, you know, cross work that very fine line of not news gathering, but providing information as it becomes available. Right. And, uh, yeah, you know, pub today so many of the PIOs think Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, but the politicians, they look at the five o'clock news. But, and their staff, not the politicians yeah. also, but the staff yeah. looks for, looks for uh, elements there. Uh, yeah. let, let me give you a great example of things that help. Um, as we speak, there's currently a uh, initiative in, by the United States Forest Service to begin charging entities who have repeaters, all kinds of repeaters, not just amateur radio, commercial repeaters too, on towers residing within United States Forest Service lands to have an annual charge of $1,400 for the leasing privileges to be on that tower. Um, ARL has filed for an exemption for amateur radio. Um, and in the submission that was sent uh, to um, the Forest Service asking for the exemption, the uh, uh, ARL's Washington attorney included a one-page article from CQ magazine about how repeaters located on U.S. Forest Service lands in California helped with notification and rescue of people from wildfires. Um, now, 
that was a trade magazine, if you will, from CQ, but it was taken and shown to policymakers. And that one article carries much more weight than showing posts in social media. Um, it does, yeah. And yeah, that that's what we need more of. And you know, I I'm not I don't want to be preaching to the choir, but you know, social media is fine, but don't forget the radio and TV stations locally. Because people don't do social media while they're driving to work. They got the radio station on. More than likely. Yes, or or the other is that um, so many radio stations these days also stream, but people are streaming them in their cars as they drive. So yeah. d uh, don't forget that uh, radio is a very versatile tool. It's not only terrestrial broadcasting, it's also uh, streaming. But the point is, it's a bona fide news outlet and it's one that can be cited uh when when uh when looking to promote ideas behind amateur radio yeah uh you know i'm looking at clock we we've, we've done about 40 minutes or so uh anything else you want to add yes one one final thing as to why education via public relations is so important the composition of both the FCC itself and uh, state and local uh, policy-making staffs has changed dramatically in the last decade. Um, we, people who were innately aware of what amateur radio is, um, now we're encountering staff people uh, who are younger age who may have never been exposed to amateur radio. Uh, and to our dismay in many ways, this includes people in Washington who have some kind of jurisdiction or regulation over amateur radio, and they don't know what it is. Um, all the more, it, 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 as astounding as that remark is, it just underscores the need for ongoing, continual public relations outreach if we wish to retain the spectrum that we have and and to restore the respect that uh, uh, was once there for amateur radio. Yeah, if, if I recall correctly, the person at the FCC who's in charge of amateur radio is a no-code tech. The, 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 there's only, what I was told, and you know, this is anecdotal, so don't take this as gospel. It needs to be exactly. substantiated. Yeah. However, in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, which is the unit inside the FCC, which regulates amateur radio, I've been told there's only one amateur licensed amateur radio operator on staff within the WTB, and that one person is a technician class licensee, which is astounding to me since this is the unit which bestows amateur amateur extra and general class licenses <laughs> yes yes so uh, it's a it's a new it's a new era and again remember the analogy i made at the top of this of this video and that is that amateur radio is like the state of alaska we have access to the second largest amount of spectrum in the United States after the federal government, and yet there's only 780,000 of us, which is uh, roughly two and a half percent of the U.S. population. Uh, and so there are many commercial entities who would love to get their hands on frequencies that we have. And I, I don't, I hate to make it a defensive gesture, but uh, public relations is education and the general public and those who regulate us or have the potential to regulate us need that education also and that reminded me of what I'd lost track of and that is when you have your license you can do anything you want within your privilege of that license as long as you don't cause interference Right. Have at it. Experiment to your heart's content. 
Exactly. You know? Exactly. As long as you don't cause malicious interference and you don't go uh, outside your the bands uh, uh, that you're, you're in, have at it. Go explore. Yeah. Invent new technologies. You know, yeah. we all owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Joe Taylor um, because he uh took a technology and introduced it at a time when the uh, solar cycle was at a low point and amateur radio got through the 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 lowest stages of, of solar cycle number 24 by really enjoying ft8 as a technology yeah and and uh, we all owe a, a debt of gratitude to joe taylor and his team for coming up with that. But that is another example of experimentation. Yeah. Well, Bill, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join me on this conversation. Gordon, it, you know uh, I'm passionate about uh, public outreach about amateur radio. Uh, we have so much we can offer to the general public, to youth, uh, to the future of our country and we need to tell that story. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Bill. Have a great day. Thanks. 73. 73.